All right, we are finishing up our, we're going through our questions and starting chapter of Romans chapter 11, uh, finishing questions from Romans 10, starting chapter 11. Uh, we, last week, we stopped right as the bell rang in asking question one uh, from our notes. And as we, when we think about the context of Romans chapter 10 and the importance of it to make sure that we have it uh, clear in our minds, I think it's important that we make sure that we are able to uh, clearly show to our friends and neighbors, especially that verse 13 in its context, make sure people understand what's going on with it. Uh, that, that's the primary reason that uh, we really want to spend some time in Romans chapter 10 to really fully appreciate uh, exactly what it is Paul's describing. So starting with uh, question one, with our questions, okay, we're up. How deeply did Paul feel about the salvation of his fellow Israelites? Did his feelings demand some effort on his part to justify Israel? Uh, from Romans chapter 9, somebody read Romans 9 verses 1 and 2, please. Romans 9 verses 1 and 2. I am telling the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience testifies with me in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and increasing grief in my heart. Okay, and that's... Unceasing grief in my heart. And that's for Israel. Okay, and that's for Israel. Uh, because Israel, by and large, has rejected uh, Christ and Him crucified, and as a result, there is, from an, an emotional perspective, Paul has sorrow and grief in his heart. Now, here in chapter 10, starting with verse 1 and 2, what does Paul say? Yeah, his heart's desire and his prayer to God is that Israel might be saved. Paul, he cares deeply for his people. And so when we ask how deeply did Paul feel about the salvation of his fellow Israelites, was it something that was very important to him? Now, even though he was sent to the Gentiles, to whom did he go first in every city, save for Philippi? Yeah, to the Jews. So this was something that was very important to him. It was very uh, close to home. I mean, of all, of all ways that phrase could be used, uh, perfect for Paul, because Paul was raised a Hebrew of Hebrews, he called himself. And so uh, when you consider his feelings towards Israel, both from an emotional state and then his desire and the fact from a, a spiritual perspective, he's praying to God that one day they may be saved. Did that lead Paul to somehow make excuses for Israel? He didn't, did he? So the second part of this question is very important, especially today. Did his feelings demand some effort on his part to justify Israel? Do you see any effort by Paul to make excuses or to, to somehow make an argument in defense of them, to justify them in any way? Or does he say it like it is? He says it like it is. So how is that applicable today? Okay. You know, it's important for us to, when we consider the closest that Paul felt with his fellow Jew, it was a family. Okay, and I have seen it firsthand. What happens when, within a family, you have a, uh, a mother or father falls away, or a child falls away, and the effort that isn't to then try to convince them to return. The effort then is try to justify them or to defend them, make excuses for them as if it's not really that bad than what it is. And it's important that we not let our emotions override what we know from what the gospel teaches us. Emotions are dictated by scripture. You know, our emotions, Paul has a zeal for God, or uh, Paul has a, 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 a care and concern for his people. Regarding the fact that these people have a zeal for God is obvious. But when it boils down to it, they're not, that, that zeal is not according to knowledge. There is no defense that can be offered to kind of argue them into heaven. It doesn't work that way. Okay, go ahead, Debbie. His deep feelings and care and concern for them cost him to pray for them. Right. It cost him to teach them. Right. To, you know, bring them to Christ. 
as opposed to gloss over it or make them feel better. Right, or to sugarcoat it. Right. Yep, mm -hmm. right. absolutely. And I think that's very applicable for us today that we observe and understand and recognize that if something takes place to somebody that's close to us, whether they're family or they're a close friend or they're somebody we grew up with at church, that we recognize that if, if somebody is not living according to the gospel, there's, there's no way to, to kind of redefine terms in the New Testament to make it okay. I, I've seen it even with preachers and their children justifying uh, the unlawful divorce and remarriage just for the sake of trying to justify their child. And you can't, that's not how, that's not how the gospel works. Go ahead, Lisa. Um, on a little broader scale, we live in a society that says, I'm okay, you're okay. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm not okay. Yeah. You know, and and I'm wrong when I do that. You know, I need to stand for the truth, or you know, I mean, not push it, but at least say, well, I mean, there's a better way. To the, there, there's a diplomatic and tactful way to deal yeah. with things like that. Yeah, but I think we have to guard against that because yeah. we care about the person or whatever, and, and they're not speaking the truth. Right. Right. You know, and it's it is it's very tempting to just kind of go with the flow, uh, especially when people keep. Uh, trumpeting love and care for others and then they equate that to uh, tolerance and acceptance and of course tolerance and acceptance are two separate terms you can tolerate something without accepting it okay God tolerates the sin of man but does he accept it no no that's not what God wants from for man to do so uh, it, but people equate love with you, you can't give any definable, uh, uh, definitive statements about God's word and about right and wrong, about judgment, about heaven or hell. Uh, and that, that causes uh, us to kind of be put in a difficult position sometimes with co-workers and friends and sometimes family even. Debbie? He recognized the scripture, didn't he? Yes, he does. The, the he knows. Fer, uh, effective, uh, the fervent, the effective fervent prayer of a righteous man well, availeth much. You know, and, and um, that's the first time in a long time that he's acknowledged he's got to make some changes. So that's a step in the right direction. Hopefully so. Yeah, absolutely. All right, anything else? The question one. Yes, sir. Um, you know, I've been thinking about this recently, and I've been thinking about how I think this is a great example to show where just because you have an emotional connection to somebody or group of people or nation doesn't make it, uh, doesn't, doesn't mean that there's a, a, a need to, to justify them or to make it okay. They're not okay, and Paul makes no bones about it. Question two, what must our zeal be coupled with in order to be approved of God? Righteousness, and of course righteousness comes by what? Knowledge, yeah, knowledge. You know, that's one of the issues that Paul had with Israel when he observes their zeal. They have a zeal for God, and is zeal a good thing to have? Yeah, knowledge without zeal, is that any good? Because zeal kind of spurs action, doesn't it? it? It spurs a response to that knowledge. Whereas zeal is action without the basis in what God says. Can you have one without the other and still be approved before God? It's not enough just to have knowledge, but then just not do anything about it. And it's not enough to have zeal without actually basing your actions on what God says. You have to have both. And that's what leads, that's what produces, brings about righteousness by faith. Okay, I believe, therefore I act, I obey. And as a result, God accounts it under righteousness. And so our zeal must be coupled with knowledge in order to be righteous before God. Uh, that is what Paul, Paul makes that very clear. 
uh, there in, in the first four verses of Romans chapter 10. Anything else to question two? And of course, that knowledge uh, through the word of God, what all is involved in that knowledge? Is it just to believe that Jesus is the Christ? Okay, yeah, so that because I believe Jesus is the Christ, I am willing to therefore confess, and I am willing therefore to call on the name of the Lord, right? Verse 13, okay, and of course calling on the name of the Lord, we've beaten that into the ground so far. I think everybody has their, their little connection there to Acts chapter uh, 22. So, uh, but that calling on the name of the Lord includes uh, being baptized for the mission of our sins. Yeah, Lisa. I think we have to also guard against our zeal for earthly things don't outweigh our zeal for spiritual things. Yeah. Because it's really easy for us to get caught up in sports teams or exciting things in our life and, and then all of a sudden the scale tip yeah. what zeal is and not where the spiritual stuff is. Yeah, there's different types of zeal. There is spiritual zeal. And then there's, uh, you know, zeal, you know, we call ourselves fans of certain football teams or basketball teams or whatever. You know what fan is short for? Fanatic. Fanatic. Yeah, fanatic. Of course, in our day and age, it's kind of a, a, a not a very good term, is it, fanatic? It kind of has a religious connotation. But the term fan, it's short for fanatic. People who are fanatic over, you know, the Spurs or whoever Dallas has, the Mavericks. Um, you know, that, that zeal that goes with them. I mean, you see some of these fans with their faces painted and, you know, got their, their costumes on and everything. And there's people who are very zealous for that type of thing. And there's people who have justified, as we spoke earlier, yeah. family members, justifying lights. Okay, we're going to go to football on Sunday. Yeah. Instead of being in worship. Yeah. You know, so where's their zeal? Right. Misplaced zeal might be a, a good way to put that. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Anything else to question two? Question three, exactly what were Paul's fellow Israelites ignorant of when they were ignorant of God's righteousness? They felt the righteousness was in the law. Okay, that is the, that is the overarching, the, the deeper application of what Paul says. Now specifically, what wouldn't they acknowledge? Or whom really wouldn't they acknowledge? Christ, right? Okay, but going even further than that, when Paul applies that in verse 4, he's acknowledging seeking to establish their own righteousness. They've not submitted to the righteousness of God. That, that's true since Christ and them crucified, okay, is, is the good news. But even before that, was it still true? Yeah. And it had, it had nothing to do with Christ and them crucified, if Christ hadn't come yet had everything to do with the fact that they were submitting, or they were, weren't submitting to the righteousness of God, which is faith, faithful obedience, and letting God account it unto righteousness. Instead, they sought to make themselves righteous, and Jesus and him crucified, the gospel of Jesus Christ, was in complete contradiction to that. Okay, it did not, the two did not coalesce. I mean, really, the old law and that didn't coalesce, but the, the Jews kind of framed it the way they wanted to. That's what it was all about, about seeking to establish their own righteousness. They kind of read into it what they wanted with regard to how one became righteous. They made their tradition even more. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Jesus Jesus acknowledged that on several occasions, didn't he? In vain do they worship me, teaching his doctrine, the commandments of men. Yeah, so I mean, traditions became just as, if not in some cases, more important than what what God had uh, passed down in the law. So yeah, they were, they were ignorant of the means by which one is made righteous, overarching principle, which is faithful obedience, but then the specific, Christ is the end of the law for righteousness. The specific aspect to that is they won't accept Christ, and of course it goes back to, well, how are they made righteous? Anything else to question three? Question four, who is the end of the law unto righteousness? Christ, how so? How is he the end of the law for righteousness? Sorry? Okay, he fulfilled all the prophecies of the old law, right? And the, the, the coming of Christ and the giving of the law, the establishment of the church, did that cap the end of all dispensation that God would give? I mean, was there going to be any more, any more law? Is there going to be a second law after the law of Christ? Christ? 
No, this is it. And that goes to the uh, last part of question four. Does this mean there is no more law? Because when people read that in verse four, we're in Romans chapter 10, uh, we're going through our questions. When people read that in verse four, what they read is Christ has put an end to the law for righteousness. There is no more law. It's just Christ and love and feeling good about ourselves. And uh, there's no specific uh, direction or no specific uh, commandments. So there's no more law. Is that what Paul says? That, that Christ has put an end to all law? No, that's not what he says. What he says is Christ is the end of the law of righteousness. That which is to say, Christ is the standard. He came and fulfilled all things concerning the old law. He is the standard of righteousness. Okay? In him, we see the fulfillment of what it means to be righteous before God. Okay, to obey complete uh, submission and obedience to the Father. That's what Christ showed. Anything else to question four? Okay, of course, you, you try to make that point to a friend or neighbor. What, what term might they call you? Legalist. Yeah, a legalist. Which is ironic because people, people use that term like a dirty word. But what, does a legal, what is legalism? What is legalist? What, what does it mean? Someone who, well, who identifies and follows law. Okay? It's someone who recognizes law and follows it. That's it. Okay? It's, not a, it's not a dirty word. And yet, uh, in our religious world, that, that concept of legalist is that it carries the connotation of binding of law. Well, sure. This is what God teaches. Therefore, it is binding. That's the nature of law. Either you do it or you don't. There will be consequences if you don't. So... Anything else to question four? Question five. Who does Moses say is righteous according to the law? And, and this applies not just the old law, even though that's, that's under which Moses is speaking, but to any law. Yeah. Specifically meaning what? How can I be righteous simply by law? I have to keep it perfectly. Yeah, I have to keep it perfectly. The moment I transgress in even one point of law, am I guilty okay. of all of it? And does law by itself allow for any forgiveness? No. That's where Christ comes in. That's why Christ had to come in apart from the law. Anything else to question five? Question six. How does Paul use Deuteronomy chapter 30, verses 12 through 14, regarding the law of Moses to show that faith is accessible to all today? This is that uh, passage where Moses is speaking to the children of Israel, who shall ascend into heaven to bring it down, who shall descend, or, or it's interesting because how Paul applies that. The term in the Old Testament, so who shall cross the sea to bring it to us, the term sea in the Old Testament literally means abyss. And often the realm of the dead was kind of called the pit. Okay, Sheol, the realm of the dead. And so Paul specifically says that what Moses was referring to wasn't just an ocean, but the abyss of the dead. And that's how Paul applies it uh, with regard to bringing Christ up from the grave. So when Paul uses Deuteronomy 30, why does he use that passage? There's, a, there's a, uh, a broad principle being established in Deuteronomy 30 with a specific application that Paul uses. What's the broad principle? How shall I obey the law? Through, through what, what means should I obey law? Is it available for me to know? So what should my motivation be in following that law? Should it be to make myself righteous? Okay, so I have knowledge of God, I have knowledge of what he wants me to do, therefore I believe him and obey, right? I obey in faith. Okay, so that is available. That was there for Moses, he made that statement in Deuteronomy chapter 30. The broad application there is God's law is accessible to you. You can obey in faith. That was true under the patriarchal law. And I, I believe that that's the same law Adam and Eve and Cain and Abel had. But if they had a previous law before that, same law then, was still by faith. Mosaical law by faith, and now law of Christ by faith. It's accessible. It's available. God has never left man without law. God has never left man without direction and understanding of what he requires of them. 
Never in the history of mankind. Always has man had direction from God. Has man chosen to ignore it? To willfully forget it? Yeah. But God has always made it accessible. And so Paul specifically applies that to Christ with regard to the new law that it is here. It is available. You can obey it. Okay? God made it available through his son. Anything else to question six? Question seven. What must one confess in order to be righteous and saved? So verses 9 and 10 specifically, one must confess what? Jesus is Lord. And then verse 10, with confession, confession is made unto what? Salvation. Okay, one must confess that Jesus is Lord. If I'm going to confess, which is to, to acknowledge, to publicly acknowledge that Christ is, or Jesus is Lord, does that mean I'm also acknowledging that he is Christ? Because if he is Lord, what does that imply? What, is, what does Lord mean? Authority? Ruler? Okay. Christ as the anointed one. Didn't David say when he was, and of course we, we look at it in terms of prophecy as Peter used it in chapter 2 and chapter 3, and the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies my footstool. Isn't Lord and Christ one and the same in the prophecies? Yeah. So everybody can understand that the Christ, the Messiah, he is Lord. David acknowledged him as my Lord. So when Paul refers to whoever confesses with the mouth that Christ or Jesus is Lord, there's an, an, an acknowledgement that that Lord is the Messiah. So, uh, what must one confess in order to be righteous and saved? That Christ is Lord, which is to also include that he is Christ. Uh, Jesus is Lord, include Christ. Uh, question eight, what must one believe in order to be righteous and saved? That he has risen from the dead. Okay? And so, with, and so belief, what does verse 10 say? One believes unto what? Righteousness. One confesses unto salvation. So it, it's kind of a, what's that term? Man, it's been a long time. A zyatic uh, statement. It's kind of an X. It crosses. So, so you have verse nine, where you have uh, belief and or, uh, confession and belief, and then it goes back. What? Chiastic. Uh, chiastic. There we go. Thank you. I was close. I was kind of there. Chiastic statement. Okay. It kind of relates to each other in the way in which Paul writes it because of the connection between belief and confession. Okay. One believes that he has risen from the dead. How will that affect us? I believe unto what? Righteousness. And isn't it interesting that Christ being risen from the dead gives power to what act? Baptism, right? According to, to 1 Peter chapter 3. Okay. The, 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 the being baptized saves us. It's the removal of the filth of the spirit, not of the flesh. And it gains that power because of Christ's resurrection from the dead. Therefore, I believe unto righteousness. Because what happens when I'm baptized? <coughs> I'm made clean. I'm made pure. God makes me righteous. Okay? So when Paul refers to these two aspects, isn't it interesting? What two things were the Israelites unwilling to do? Yeah, they were unwilling to confess that he is Lord they were unwilling to believe that he was risen from the dead. These were the stumbling blocks. These were the things in the way of Israel becoming saved. It has nothing to do uh, with a separate means of salvation for Israel than for the Gentiles. It's all the same. That's what verse 12 is for. But the understanding is that these two stumbling blocks are the main stumbling blocks in the way for Israel to be saved. Anything else through questions 7 and 8? They kind of, kind of go together. Question nine, who will never be put to shame? Huh? Those who, believe on him. Those who believe on him shall never be put to shame. Why? What is put to shame? What does that mean? What does that imply? Let down. Okay. What, 
for what reason would I have shame before God? Sin and guilt, right? But he who believes on him shall be approved, not put to shame. The opposite of being put to shame is to be found approved. And so the idea of whoever believes on him will therefore do what? Obey. And because they obey in faith, they will be found approved before God and not, not put to shame. All right, so who will never be put to shame? The one who obeys in faith. Obeys in faith. Uh, question 10. How does one call upon the name of the Lord? First of all, is it a single statement or act? Or is it a process? What all is involved in the process of calling on the name of the Lord? How, do, how does one accomplish this? We already acknowledge, verse 17, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So then, how does, what's the very basis, what's the start of calling on the name of the Lord? Okay, well, I hear the gospel. What must I let the gospel do? Yeah, I must let it convict me, right? That conviction must lead me to do what? Repent. Okay, acknowledge my sin, acknowledge my wrongs. Remember, we look at the, the example of Felix, okay? And we think about Felix and the fact that he heard the gospel, and was there some part of that that caused him to be afraid? As, as Paul was reasoning with Felix regarding uh, the righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come, Felix trembled. Okay, there was a recognition of truth, but did Felix allow that hearing of the gospel to produce in him a conviction to act? At least not as far as what's recorded, right? I, like, I hope that later on he did. But as far as what we know, he didn't. And so how does one call upon the name of the Lord? They must let the gospel produce in them a working faith, a faith that is willing to repent, faith that is willing to confess that Christ, Jesus is the Christ, Son of God, He is Lord, and one that is willing to be what? Baptized for the remission of their sins. Acts twenty two sixteen. That is included in calling on the name of the Lord. Anything else to question 10? Because that's what I control. Right? Those are the things I have control over. Okay, it's not what God forces me to do. There's the, the acknowledgement or the understanding here in verse, uh, or question 10 with regard to calling on the name of the Lord. That is my responsibility. Well, the teaching of the gospel is sounding out. Once I hear it, it is my responsibility to act upon it. Question, or question, yeah, question 11, what steps must be taken before one can call upon the name of the Lord? That the culmination, which we, we kind of just already answered that, but the culmination of calling on the name of the Lord, what brings that to an end? What act? That process. What's the final step of that process? Baptism. Therefore, all the steps previous that we observe in the New Testament, again, we call them steps of salvation. That's our way of putting it, for lack of a better term. But it's all the processes that we see and individuals taking, specifically in the book of Acts, showing how these, what, what these individuals do and how they do it in order to come to the point of being baptized. And, of course, we talked about repentance and confession being specifically those two. Okay, belief is required as a basis. Okay, otherwise, confession, repentance, baptism means nothing if there's not belief. That's why, and, of course, that's part of the implication of Mark 16, 16, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. So does baptizing babies do any good? Can they believe? Can they, do they have anything of which to repent? Can they confess? No. There's no point in baptizing babies since none of those apply to them. So belief is the basis. That's why I don't include belief with question 11, simply because I'm not going to do any of the others if I don't have belief anyway. So once I have that faith, that belief, that, that spur me, spurs me to act, the steps that I take are to repent, confess, and, of course, the culminating of calling on the name of the Lord is baptism. Anything else through questions 10 and 11? They really, I really should put them together. Yes, sir. Well, calling upon the name of the Lord, the name implies, of course, the authority. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2 says, Jesus is the author of salvation. Yeah. So you're calling upon the author 
more than authorized, more than has the authority to put into place the plan that brings about salvation. Right. If you go to any other source, you're not going to achieve the salvation that he offers. Right. You may achieve something else, <laughs> but, but you're calling upon that authority because he's the one who has that authority. Right, absolutely. In fact, with that process. yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and, and in fact, that's the reason why uh, between the, the examples that were given of people being baptized, we baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. Okay, this, this process of salvation, this plan of salvation, all three were involved in culminating in Christ uh, being raised from the dead. He is the author and finisher of our, finisher of our faith, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. Okay, he is the author and finisher of our faith. All right, anything else through, through questions 10 and 11? Yes, sir. I believe parallels began going back to Genesis 12 and 13. Abram, is, he's gone as the Lord has told him. He's going, walking through the land of Canaan. And the Lord makes a promise to him. I'm going to give this land to your seed. Immediately, Abram builds an altar and calls on the name of the Lord. Same thing seen in chapter 13 as well. Yeah. Yeah, some parallels of recognizing the, the characteristics and, and responses involved in calling on the name of the Lord. That's a great point. Yeah, I thought about Old Testament examples of that. Thank you, Norm. All right, anything else to questions 10 and 11? Question 12. Contrast verse 17 with the so-called experiences of faith in our day. In what key respect are they different, and how does this fact fit into the context of chapter 10? Which is to say, in the passage, verse 17, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. There are those who believe that faith cometh by experiences. Revelation is directly from God. And there's variations on that theme. You can't really have faith until God kind of causes it inside of you. And if you never come to the point where you have faith, then you won't be condemned because God never saw fit to cause you to have faith. It's a circular argument all the way around. But... Verse 17 specifically says, what, is, what, in, what brings about faith? Yeah, hearing the word of God. Okay, not an experience. So when verse 12, or, <laughs> sorry, question 12, the latter part of that, in what key respect are they different? Okay, well, there aren't religious experiences the way the religious world views them. When I read the word of God and it convicts me, I mean, I guess you could call that an experience from the perspective of I am experiencing shame and remorse. I'm recognizing my need to be saved. I guess you could put it that way. But in the idea of the context of chapter 10, how does that idea fit? The idea of hearing the word of God. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God compared to having experience, uh, or not being judged because God didn't cause it, didn't allow it. And really, this goes back to chapter 9, too. Yes, sir. Go back to the verse you talked earlier, going back to Deuteronomy 30. Because the word of God is not, it's accessible, it's close, you can have it. It's not some miraculous or something that only happened to you and it can't be explained, it can't be replicated. You, know, you just got to believe me right. that it happened. But there's a standard, one that's for all. Right. Absolutely. There's a, there's a single standard. And verse 12 fits into that. The same for Jew or Gentile. Right? And Paul knows of which he speaks because didn't Paul have an experience on the road to Damascus? But he wasn't saved out of that experience. A lot of times, we were, we, a lot of times the phrase, and I, I heard the phrase growing up, and I understand what it meant, but Paul's conversion on the road to Damascus. You could say his attitude was changed, that his mindset was changed. Okay? But was he converted on the road to Damascus? Was he made a Christian on the road to Damascus? No. And of course, what carries with these experiences is the idea that the moment that that experience is had, I'm saved. There is no process of salvation in that mindset. Once I have that experience, that's it. I'm done. Faith has been produced, and now I'm, I'm a Christian. It didn't work that way for Paul. Yes, ma'am. Well, when we think about the day of Pentecost, those people were pricked in their heart, right? Yeah. Yeah. And a lot of times the experiences today are emotions. emotions. But they were given, they were told what they needed to do. They didn't right. stop at the experience or the emotion of feeling bad for what they had done. They followed the direction given to them. So one is fact-based, 
and one is emotionally based. That's a great point. That's a great point. And most of our religious world tends to react based on emotion and define even God's word based on emotion rather than letting the facts and the word of God speak for itself and causing one to act in accordance with what it says. Okay, yeah, this, it really does boil down to uh, God's word versus man's subjective emotions. Yeah, it, it's, it's, and it helps to be able to try to separate that here in chapter, because chapter 9 deals with, as Jews, well, who is God to judge us? God put us in this position in the first place. He caused us to be this way, so if we don't have faith, it's not our fault. Paul says, no, that's not true. And so now in chapter 10, whoever calls the name of the Lord shall be saved. That calling on the name of the Lord, how is it inspired? Is it inspired by emotion or an experience? Or is it inspired by what God says? Knowledge. 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 So therefore, I must with belief, a belief unto righteousness, and confession is made unto salvation. Not God causing you to have an experience and making you have faith. It doesn't work that way. Lisa? Yeah. Um, their lives don't change, but in every instance in the Bible, we're told time and time again that people's lives change. Yeah. They, their they conduct know, changes. One of these, but now you're not. Yeah. You know. And yep. So you know, people say they they have an experience, but they, they still drink or they yeah. still cuss or they, you know whatever. The Didn't do anything. No, they're going to church now. Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, or, or maybe it's how they, they look at themselves. They have more self-esteem or self-respect or however you want to put it. Yeah. It's, not, it's definitely not knowledge-based because you don't see that repentance. Right. Right. You know, there's a, there's a phrase we use, the proof is in the pudding, right? And so people who are truly convicted, it, does it show in their lives? Yeah. Yeah. And unfortunately, emotions, are, are they... The memory of emotions last, but do the emotions themselves last? No. no. No, the emotions themselves don't last. When we think back on a happy moment or a sad moment, we have the memory of what that felt like. But that, that emotion itself it may not necessarily be there. Yes, ma'am. almost everyone in this room, including the younger kids, have had emotions like that. Oh, yeah. If you think somebody likes you or you think this or that, and yeah, it is a total... It was wrong. Your emotion, your reaction to whatever happened was wrong. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> Anything else to question 12? Question 13. How does Paul prove with Scripture that God would be identified with other nations? Not just identified with Israel, but with all. What does Paul do? Twice. He quotes what? Prophecy, right? He goes back to prophecy and specifically acknowledges that God has said before. Twice he says. And then he quotes Isaiah with referred, uh, referring to Israel. But he uses prophecies describing how that other nations would be identified. Oh, I'm sorry. Identified. Uh, would identify God, would seek after God, uh, would be found by him. Okay, I, uh, Isaiah is very bold. Well, Isaiah is very bold because Isaiah specifically prophesies that one day people who aren't even Jews will be more approved than you so-called Jews who aren't serving God. It occurs to me that Paul didn't know what we know now that Israel by and large would continue to reject the Messiah. He may not have been able to tell the future is what you're saying, yeah. Right. Uh, he did everything that, that he could to bring them back. Right. He gave them to the Jews. He became a Jew. Right. Think of what he did when he went to Jerusalem for the last time, uh, going into the temple with those right. men and, and going through the traditions. Yep. But, yeah. Just well, and, and that'll carry over into chapter 11 as well, with all of Israel being saved. The hope and the plan was for Israel to... Be, be provoked to jealousy and therefore come back to God. But in another example of God allowing man free will, does Israel do that? By and large, no. Uh, 
I mean, are there Jews who do, are saved not only at this point, but later? Sure. But by and large, I mean, especially compared to the Gentiles, Israel continues to not allow that jealousy. They, well, they, I guess you could say they were provoked to jealousy, but not in a good way. Right? The response wasn't, wasn't what it should have been. Yeah. Anything else to question 13? Question 14, how does Paul prove with Scripture that Israel has refused to submit to God's standard of becoming righteous? How does he prove that? He made this case earlier in chapter 10 at the beginning. They've now submitted to the righteousness of God. But how does he prove that with Scripture? He quotes Old Testament there at the end. What does he say? Somebody, somebody read the last two verses of Romans chapter 10. Isaiah is very bold and said, I was found to them that sought me not. I was made manifest unto them that asked not after me. But to Israel he said, All day long I have stretched forth my hands unto a disobedient and gainsaying people. Paul says that's still happening at this point in time, doesn't he? Paul's applying that, that state, and that was applicable in Isaiah's time. And it's kind of like how we've mentioned Stephen in Acts chapter 7, just as your fathers did, so do you. You reject the Holy Spirit. You reject all of the prophets. I mean, is there a prophet that they did not persecute? I mean, we have examples of prophets who were you know, kings and the people would reject them simply because they didn't want to hear what he had to say. Everything's doom and gloom with you. you know, throw you in a pit so we don't have to listen to you. And so the idea that Paul, he used, he shows that Israel has refused to submit to God's standard of becoming righteous by recognizing all day long I stretch out my hand and yet what are they doing? They're doing what they want. They're doing it their way as opposed to God. Anything else to question 14? Question 15. All right. That's the end of the questions. I'm not even, the bell's going to ring in like 30 seconds. So we're not going to start chapter 11. We'll start chapter 11 next week, and we're going to go a little bit quicker, um, hopefully half a chapter per, per class at least. Uh, the notes are on the back table for Romans chapter 11, so they're available on the back table, uh, and we'll pick up there next week. Thank you.